Acts chapter 13, verse 5. Acts chapter 13, verse 5. John Mark is a minister to the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. He accompanied them at the very beginning of their travel and journey. But unfortunately, as many of you know the story, he did not follow through all the way. Notice Acts chapter 13 and <coughs> verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Jump to verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. The passage never told us what bothered John Mark or what caused him to quit the ministry. But there's one thing that we do know is that there was something inside that bothered him. There was an issue or some issues that he had he was never able to resolve. And those things turned out to be a huge bother in his life that he couldn't foresee himself continuing on in the ministry and he abandoned ship. If you read that entire passage, you would think that nothing went wrong. Paul and Barnabas have received a great revival, great start in the ministry. The Holy Ghost filled the Apostle Paul, the Bible says, and there was much fruit. Even the deputy of that location got saved. But during the midst of that, all that entire time, they did not realize, and maybe John himself did not realize, that he was not doing okay. In the midst of fruit revival and how God's using your life, it's easy to get lost into that and not see your troubled issues that you still have inside. You might think you're okay, but my question to you is, are you really okay? And that's the title of my message is, are you okay? Let's pray. Uh, Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Um, there's a reason why uh, you had me... Uh, work hard in this message tonight, and um, I've done my best, but Lord, all of it is nothing without the filling of your spirit. I am nervous. I am not in my best shape or form. May you guide and completely use me. May the preaching hit everyone and help everyone, and may it glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at the first point, the strength of preachers. The strength of preachers. Think about it. If John Mark confessed to Paul and Barnabas at the beginning that he's not doing okay at the beginning of verse 5, that's when he started out in the ministry, then he would have been in the safer side. He would have resolved the issue sooner rather than letting it build up and then haunt him and get him to quit the Christian race. He could have gotten the help he needed, but why didn't he ask for help? Why didn't he ask for help? Well, if you look at verse 5, it's because he's a preacher. He's supposed to be strong. He's supposed to know better. In verse 5, the Bible said and they had also John to their minister. That's something right there. John Mark, he was considered equal with Paul and Barnabas, fellow minister. And he was able to preach, to teach, and do great things along with the apostles Paul and Barnabas. Maybe because of that expectation, he was telling himself, I should be stronger than this. Perhaps because of that expectations, he was thinking, I should know better. Why would I whine? I sound like a sissy Christian. I got to be stronger. I got to be stronger. But the problem is, he's John. He's not Paul. Right. He's just a John. What's so special about him compared to the Apostle Paul, who's zealous for the Lord, who's used to hardship, who knows so much of that book in and out that he could debate effectively in the synagogues. He was considered one of the apostles. You know, if John realized, hey, I'm not Paul, and if he humbled himself and realized, I got to stop comparing myself to Paul. Yeah. I got to realize that I'm weaker than Paul. I can't preach as well as Paul. I can't teach as well as Paul. I don't know much as Paul does. I got to realize that I am weak and the devil might tempt and say to him, oh man, you look like a sissy when you say that, right? Look, how will other people view you? You're a minister. You should know better. You should be stronger than this. John Mark should have just 
accepted that and be humbled and say, you know what, you're right, uh, that uh, I'm weak, I'm pathetic, and people will see me that way, and you know what? It's the truth. Yeah, cool. It's the truth, and I need help. Yeah. You know, you need to stop thinking so highly of yourself. Okay. You are not the Apostle Paul. You are not Peter Ruckman. Right. You are not David Peacock. Amen, amen. You are not Kyle Stevens. You're not Steve Andrus. Right. You're just a John. What's so special about you? You need to swallow your pride and humble yourself and say, look, let's just be honest. You know, people know that I minister to the Apostle Paul, but I'm not like him. I got to humble myself, not care what other people think and ask for help. Ask for advice. Oh, it makes me look weak. And no, 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 no. You need help. It makes me look like a weak ministry leader. No, you need help. It makes me look like a weak father or husband. No, you need help. It makes me look like a weak sister in Christ in the church. No, you need help. It makes me look like a babe, even though a lot of people see me as the one who knows all the doctrines and attends the church and does a lot of things for the church. No, you still are a babe. You need to swallow your pride and realize you're just a John. You're just a John. So, in this case, a preacher right here like John Mark kept pushing himself and saying, I'm stronger than this. Oh, I can handle this and I know better. And no, to be honest, you don't know better. Can I tell you this? Because probably you'll never get this from anybody. No one will call you this. So I'll just say it for you. I'll do you the favor. You're stupid. You're stupid. Okay? You need to accept that and say, look, I need help. I need someone to guide me. I'm not special. I'm not strong to handle this. My second point is the steps of Paphos. The steps of Paphos. Now, isn't it interesting that during this story, as I was searching and reading, I'm like, what would make John Mark leave the ministry? I'm trying to look at any trace and any clue within that story. And the Bible never mentions it. Never mentions and won't tell you the details of what got John Mark out of the ministry. Maybe Paul was too rough for him. Maybe the journey was too long. Maybe he missed his mother and back home. Or maybe he was worldly. I don't know. But the Bible never mentioned what bothered John Mark so much that he believed he should leave the ministry. I do know this, though, is that during his 90-mile journey from Salamis to Paphos, something must have happened. That's the only clue that we can get is at verse 6. Verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, now remember, they were originally at verse 5, Salamis, right? Somewhere in the middle of those steps that he took from Salamis to Paphos, something bothered him. That's all I know. Something was welling up inside that it didn't just happen one time. This was 90 miles, remember. 90 mile journey from Salamis to Paphos, or approximately from what I gathered from other resources. And the reason why we all don't know is because he never said it. John Mark never said it. He never told Paul what he needed help on and what his problem was. He kept it inside. Maybe because John Mark, whatever bothered him, think about this, he probably didn't even know they were issues. In this passage right here, it's just a normal thing, just walking and ministering, serving God, preaching from Salamis to Paphos. And during that whole time, John Mark, while he's preaching and teaching and all throughout that entire step that he took in his walk with the Lord from Salamis to Paphos, he didn't know there were issues because, hey, I'm doing okay. Everything's okay. Nothing wrong, nothing major. I'm just going on with my life. 
But, boy, was he wrong because during those 90 miles, it did turn something where he had to abandon the ministry. We know that. Sometime as you're going through your steps in life, as you go to Paphos, you're probably like John Mark, just, yeah, everything's okay. I don't see anything wrong. You know, just same old Sunday, go to church, sing a hymn, play the piano, song lead, give an announcement, fellowship with my brother and sister, write on the volunteer sheet, bring the food and same old, same old in the workplace, same old, same old in my home and same old, same old life. And as you're going through your steps in the Christian walk from Salamis to Paphos, you're probably like John Mark, where you think it, everything's okay. You don't see anything wrong. But unknowingly, there are some issues you have inside. And those issues, like John Mark, later turn into a heavy burden that bothered him, that he didn't catch, that he didn't keep track, that he didn't realize, and got him to quit the ministry. Usually, when you get something that really bothers you, that make you want to quit the ministry, it just don't pop out like that. Right, right, right. It comes from somewhere. You need to go back a step. You need to go back a step. There were certain issues that were unresolved. But you didn't catch it. You left it hanging. And those sneaky little issues, that flesh is so sneaky, wicked, and ignorant that it snuck right in. And then those little issues start to build up on top of each other. And then it started to burden your heart and you couldn't breathe and then overwhelmed your mind that you felt like you were going to die. And then you felt like you had every reason in the world that you need to just abandon ship. You, it, don't come out like that just one night. Something that really bothers you, that gets you out of the race, comes from issues that were unresolved, okay. that kept building up, that you didn't know about. Why? Because you think you're okay. Right. That's good. I'm okay. Nothing wrong. I'm just tired. I'm just too busy. And, you know, it's just life. And I just have to go through. And, but you let, let those things hang in your unconscious state. And then when that big thing happens that will cause you to abandon ship for the Lord Jesus Christ, all those unconscious feelings that you went through start to build up on top of each other and they go, bam, all at once. But you don't know about that. You don't keep track of that. You didn't realize that. Hits you all at once without knowing. And that's our problem is... We think that those issues are minor in those steps we took for the Lord. Or it's not really that important. And John Mark, hey, hey, 90 miles, right? You walked over 90 miles and you left that much unresolved? It's turning into a dangerous burden. And it's going to get you, eat you up. Get you to throw out of your Christian race if you don't get it resolved. Okay. Those issues that are unresolved turn into a big burden. Yes. And once they turn and transform into a big burden, it's enough to even split homes, okay. split church, yep. split your own mental state and well-being. Wow. You know what would have solved that? Well, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6 says, A multitude of counselors, there is what? Safety. Multitude of counselors, there is safety. If John Mark had these issues, and if he actually talked to the Apostle Paul about it, if he was able to resolve them, get the help that he needed, get good advice from the Apostle Paul, do you think that those issues would have later came out in life and turned into a big burden that got him out of the race? No. Because he resolved them early. Yeah, that's good. He got counsel that was needed. You know what the purpose of counsel is? To protect you. To resolve an issue. Think about it. If every issue you thought was minor and not a big deal, oh, you were wrong later on. But if those little things were solved by a little bit of counsel, okay. and then as much counsel, 
they wouldn't build up each other, they would have been gone. And you wouldn't have a big burden right here. But you think you're Paul, aren't you? You little John, you. You're just a John. You know, uh, how I became the person that I am today is through counsel you have to realize. You don't just become like this. I had to get as much counsel as I can. And believe it or not, even uh, your pastor yourself can learn from even a newcomer. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that I lose my leadership authority and then say, you know, follow every newcomer in the room, then you know, I'm not a good leader. But my point is, I don't think that I'm such a good leader that no one tells me okay. that I can't learn anything from anybody. Right. No, I'm very observant. I always keep an eye out. I always learn. I always hear. I look at how God uses their lives. I would ask questions at times. I'll admit my incompetencies at times. I would receive it. And because of that, that's how I'm able to come out the way that I am. But guess what? I'm still not there. Would you believe that? I'm still not there. But I do know this. It protected me so far. How many people have I seen my age didn't do that? Yeah. Then they got, yeah. they thought they were Paul. Oh, yeah. Then they turned into pride. Then they turned into big losers and you don't hear them anymore. Here's a question. If you, the more counsel you have, that verse says you're safe, right? My question then to you is, if you need that much counsel to be that much safe, how much advice or counsel have you gotten from the pastor lately? Can you go on years without it? You probably surpassed 90 miles. That's good. Amen. And you wonder why you got problems. Think about it. Maybe the current problems you have wouldn't exist if they were resolved long ago. Those things you thought were minor, right? Those things that weren't important. Those things that you didn't think would affect you later on and give you a burden. You know, another problem with people on the other extreme is with every issue they go through, they feel like, I need to tell the pastor this, and then they turn out to be people who dump burdens on people. Yep. And it's not just the pastor. They go to every single person in the pew. Yep. You, ever, you ever come across those people, and then you think that the church is in trouble, when in reality, it's not. <laughs> and you get those kind of people who just keep dumping and filling up your phone calls. Oh, I got a problem, I got a problem. You know what your problem is? My friend, you didn't go 90 miles like John Mark. You just, uh, what you did was, is that you just went uh, 0.3 miles and I got an issue, I got a problem, and I, then you went to 0.5 miles and I got an issue and I got a problem, then you went to 0.1 mile and said, oh, I need help. It gets worse because you depend on that thing more. Then it goes from 0.01 miles, I need help, then 0.001 miles, I need help, and that's what happens. Because you're in such a habit of dumping burdens on people. Look, you didn't go 90 miles like John Mark. You need to learn to be strong and depend on the Lord, not depend on people. You know, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, come unto me. He didn't say come unto men. Drop the N, okay? M-E. Come unto me, Jesus said. You need to learn to depend on Jesus Christ and not on other people. But my friend, some of you went 100 miles... And it's about time that you need to ask for help. Yes. Now, there's three things that people usually mess up in confessing their burdens, which is why you get a lot of issues. There's one extreme that you dump all the burdens, the other extreme that you're just carrying it all the way. Oh, what, what do I need to do? Well, number one is this, is that people who have the tendency to dump burdens on people I know this, you don't first pray and wait on the Lord for a couple of weeks. Okay. If there's something that bothers you, call, call 911. I need to tell somebody my problem. Here's my best friend, my sister in Christ, my brother in Christ. Pastor is there for me. No. You don't first pray and wait on the Lord a couple of weeks. You don't see God moving in your life. I promise you this, all right? 90, uh, a lot of times I realize when... I help people with their issues. 
most of the time I'll help them because I can see that. But then other times I realize, you know, just pray to the Lord about it. Wait, yeah. wait a little longer. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't ask me later on about that. Why? Because the Lord needs to step in and handle the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Not Dr. Gene Kim, UC Berkeley, and PBI. No, what are you talking about, man? No, it's Jesus Christ. Yeah. You need to have that kind of tendency. A second thing is you don't know how to confess discreetly. It's not confess openly. No, confess discreetly. In life, everything comes with discretion. The Bible says you are to be discreet. You need to think of the right person to talk to. All right? Don't talk to the person sitting next to you, okay? The first person I find, no, probably the last person to find, all right? You need the right person to talk to. You need the right timing. You don't time things right, you know? 2 a.m. I need help and you're not going to die. You can wait. You need the right timing. And another thing, this is important, which is why people are uncomfortable with disclosing. This is important. As you talk to the person and confess, you need to gradually, gradually confess where things, where you can tell by the flow of the conversation that, oh, I can give a little bit more specifics. And as you give a little more specifics and you realize, oh, I got to stop right here. Got to keep it here. Yeah. Keep it general. Keep it general. Right. What are you struggling with? I'm struggling with this kind of beeps and, no, I don't want to hear it. Just say, I'm struggling with an addict, uh, with a sinful habit. Yes. I need help. Right. Do it that generally. Amen. And then, as the conversation goes, I guess I can disclose something a little more here. It's my thought life. And I'm having trouble where all these times these thoughts come out. You don't have to tell them the details of what your imagination went through, okay? But see that gradual specifics and then the gradual general. You got to go like this when you talk. And then, I mean, you're not dumb. You can tell, okay? If you're in control of your emotions, then you can tell as you do this with people. Confession comes out. The Lord will show you how much to confess and how much not to confess. There's a, there's a gradual level of that. Sometimes you'd be surprised. You can give as much specific as you want. There are councils like that. But that don't come at the very first meeting, all right? That comes through time and how the Lord leads. And you can tell by the flow of the environment when it happens. Another thing people don't consider, which is why they all mess up in this, is, well, I just can't confess the burdens and I can't tell the pastor this or I can't uh, seek advice or help on this. Look, if you're still not doing okay after many days of praying now and waiting on the Lord and God still never showed you what to do, don't you think maybe God wants you to stop praying this time and ask for help? Okay. Yeah. Now you might go, no, that's blasphemy. Then why would God even give counselors? Maybe God says, I think it's time you humbled yourself, okay. swallowed your pride, and said, hey, I need help with this. Amen. Look, uh, it's not God's will to disobey his word when he said, bear one another's burdens. Yeah. Do you think he wants you to disobey that command? It's a command. He said, bear ye one another's burdens. It's never his intention for you to disobey it. So, don't hide the burden from the brethren unless, unless you're 1,000% certain that you know it's God's will, that you know it's God's command that, hey, this is between me and you. Once you're there, then you know, okay, then I better keep it to me and God. But if God never gave you that command, then... He already has something written out. Bury one another's burdens. My third point is the spirit of Paul. The spirit of Paul. Notice the timing that John Mark left was 
not at the beginning of these, the steps to Paphos. It was after Paul preached. Notice that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and he got to preach to the deputy and there were souls saved. Man, look how spiritual Paul was at verse 9, all right? Verse 9. Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 10, he rebuked a sorcerer full of all subtlety and mischief. He was strong. He was bold. He didn't care. Verse 11, he said, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Verse 12, the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed and got saved. He believed in right doctrine. And then, verse 13, John Mark's gone. Why? Well, if John were to see verse 9, 10, 11, 12, if John was there, he saw Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was bold, he was strong in the Lord, he's so busy in the ministry, so many souls get saved, you think John Mark can have the guts to say, hey, I'm struggling with a problem, or they think, no, nah, uh, no, I don't think I should tell him. I think it's something I should keep to myself. In the midst of God's spirit overflowing in the church and using it, souls getting saved and the pastor might be busy with something and God's hand is on him and he's strong and he's firm and he rebukes sin. You think that you have the guts to say, hey, pastor, I got a problem or. That's good. He's very spiritual. He's on a very high spiritual plane. The Lord's using him. I can't, I can't, I can't talk to him about it. Maybe John Mark is ashamed to say he's not doing okay to Paul because Paul would probably see John as chicken maybe because Paul is so spiritual, God has used him, and John's such a coward. Or maybe that Paul would see him as, you're watered down. You just don't know much about that book and you're just compromising with the world. Or maybe... Uh, John was worried. Paul might accuse and think, John, that you're so worldly. You just have some sins that you're not right with God. That would happen if John Mark, that would happen for anyone who saw the spiritual growth and might of God using that preacher. A person wouldn't have the guts to say, hey, I need help or I'm, I'm not doing okay. They'd be afraid. There's so much shame. And that's the number one factor why people don't confess their burdens. Shame. The number one issue is shame. But, you know, Paul is not that type of person. I mean, look at Galatians uh, 6, Galatians chapter 6. Paul's not that type of person where, you know, he's so strong and he's so spiritual, he rebukes sin and, you know, John, you're such a sissy and you don't have the guts, you don't have the strength and you're a real Bible believer, you gotta... Hold the fort and you're just so worldly, you're not right with God. No, look, Paul's not that type. Look at Galatians 6, 1 through 2. Paul knew full well. He knew full well that there are people in the church who are generally hurt and they need their burdens to be carried. And that one must be meek to their level, understanding and help. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, right? Like Paul. The Holy Ghost fell on Paul. I'm spiritual. Ye which are spiritual, what? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Because Paul realized, I'm not better than you, John Mark. It could happen to me. That's why he said in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens. Paul's the type that would have helped John Mark if he would just ask. But John, he was intimidated. He was scared because he saw how spiritually high Paul was. He saw the Holy Ghost filling the Apostle Paul. Whereas John Mark, he's down at the bottom and he feels so low. You know, Shame is the number one factor that will prevent you from confessing your burden because you feel like, oh, they're too spiritual for me or they're high up there and oh, they're, they don't get what I'm going through. No, our job is to bear your burdens. Yes, yes. Our job is, if we are truly spiritual, to restore you in meekness. That's our job. Amen. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Keep your hand at Acts 13. We'll go back in Acts 13, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 21. Didn't you know God's purpose is not to make you feel shame? God's purpose is to give you honor. Honor is the opposite of shame. Dishonor means shame. And God's intention is through helping out and bearing the burdens of others and helping those who are weak. His intention is not to shame you. His intention is to give you honor and even more abundantly. You might say, really? I mean, what's the honor in confessing the fault? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, the Bible reads here, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, one member in the body of Christ is not more spiritual or better than the other one. They need each other. They're in the same boat. Verse 22, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more what? Feeble. Oh, I'm not spiritual. And yeah, you're feeble. You're feeble. You're a feeble member. You just need to accept that. Oh, what's the honor in that? Oh, the shame. Oh, the shame. No, God's intention is not to shame the feeble. The verse says in verse 23, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Uh-huh, right? Oh, the shame. Upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need but God, it's God, God who tempered the body together having given what? More abundant honor to that part which lack. It's God's job, job to honor you. But if you don't confess that fall and that burden because you're afraid of shame, guess what? Dishonor and shame will control your life. Free yourself from that. Let God give you honor. The only way you can get honor is that the shameful, dishonorable parts that you fear are surrendered to God and that he replaces it with abundant honor. But he'll never replace it if you don't give it to him. He'll never replace it if you don't go by his terms of what he says. If you won't go by letting the body of Christ fill out those feeble parts. If shame is holding you back, then guess what? Shame is in control over your life. You want to be free from shame, then let God give you honor. Come to him with your shame and give it a trade-off. Let God fill in the dishonorable parts. The fourth point, now this is very important, is the stab of preaching. Go to Acts 13, Acts chapter 13. Now this is probably one of the most important parts you want to hear. <clears throat> right after John Mark left, you'll notice that Paul is preaching to the Jews. But while he's preaching to the Jews, look what comes up, all right? Look what name comes up. Acts 13, verse 13. Now when Paul and his company from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John's gone now, all right? Verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, <coughs> they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. So Paul's about to preach, okay? He's going to preach his sermon. Now remember, John Mark just left him, okay? And that probably bothered Paul, right? I mean, that would bother anyone if you're in the ministry and somebody leaves. Did it bother Paul? Well, let's take a look. In verse 16, he's about to preach, and in the middle of his preaching, look at verse 24. He's still preaching. Verse 24. When what? John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. 
Now look, while he's preaching his sermon, he's mentioning about John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist came. Now when he mentions that name, don't you think in his mind, John Mark just popped into his head? If it bothered him, it sure popped out. I think so, because look at the next verse. This is weird. I think so, because look at the very next verse, verse 25. And as John, what? Fulfilled his course. He said, who thinking, wait, wait, hold on right there. That phrase is not needed. John fulfilled his course. Why would he say John the Baptist finished his race? He finished his course. Why would he say that when the point of verse 25 is not John finishing his race? The point of verse 25 with John the Baptist is paving the way for Jesus Christ. So the whole subject is about John the Baptist introducing Jesus Christ. Why would he all of a sudden mention John finished his race? And then, but he was paving the way for Jesus Christ. You know what the thing about preachers are, you know? In the middle of their preaching, you know? Then all of a sudden, when they mention a name, then somebody's name pops out in the middle of their sermon, you know, that slips in because they were talking about so-and-so over there. You know, that's the fear usually when you sit under preachers. I've been under that. I, whenever I'm sitting a preach and I'm like, is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? And then most of the time, the preacher had no idea it was about you. But at times, it do ha uh, those things do happen. Those things do happen. So it slipped in in Paul's message right here. I think he mentioned that because you think about John Mark. He didn't finish his race. But John the Baptist finished his race. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Okay, this really bugged Paul. Notice he took a stab at John Mark in his preaching here, right? He took a stab at him when he was talking about John the Baptist. <laughs> Well, what was it that Paul thought, this is what John the Baptist finished his race that John Mark failed to do? What was it that John the Baptist did that made him fulfill his race, but John Mark failed to do that? Well, let's go to John the Baptist's life. Maybe this John did something that the other John didn't do. Wonder what it was. Go to... I think Paul knew what it was. Go to Luke 7. Luke 7. I think Paul knew why he said John the Baptist finished his race. Because John the Baptist was struggling. Okay. He had issues inside that he needed to confess. He was totally discouraged. I mean, this is John the Baptist who's strong and bold for Jesus Christ and didn't care what King Herod said. And then now he's, he's in prison and he's like, oh man, I'm struggling so much. Hmm. And what did John the Baptist do? Did he, during his discouragement, keep it in like John Mark? Or, let's look at verse 19. Verse 19. The Bible says, and John the Baptist, 19, and John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, <coughs> Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Now, <laughs> look, Jesus Christ is similar to what Paul was doing. The Spirit of God is on him. He's so busy in the ministry. There's so much fruit coming up. And John the Baptist had to interrupt had to disrupt by sending people and say, hey, uh, are you really the Christ? What a thing to say, man. You know what he had? He had guts. He summoned the courage to say, hey, I need to confess my issue, my burden with you. But he's stuck in prison. He could have had the excuse, oh, look, I'm stuck in prison. Jesus can't hear me. What can I do? Oh, woe is me. No, he said, no, I need help, and I need help, and hey, you two, come over here. I don't care if I can't go over to him. You two need to go all the way over there, but Jesus is healing the blind and the sick. No, you need to go there. I have a burden I need to confess, and I need him to help me out. That's good. He had the courage. He had the courage to confess, even if it took work, effort, even if he was intimidated by Jesus' spiritual power. No, he summoned the courage. I am weak, 
I know I paved the way and argued you were the Christ, but now I'm in doubt and I need help. You know, this is even more interesting. The most important part you want to hear. You ready for this? Verse 22, Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things he has seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The, to the poor the gospel is preached. And then we skip verse 23. Jesus ended his speech, right? No, Jesus added verse 23. And blessed is he, Whosoever shall not be offended in me. You know what Jesus did? Jesus, sure, he encouraged John when he confessed. But he said, I need to leave you with a little stab. I need to stab you. I need help, Jesus. This ain't helping me. No, it's helping you. You need a rebuke. You know why people aren't able to ask for advice or afraid to confess burdens? They're afraid to get stabbed. That's the most important thing you want to hear. Hey, you're not Paul. You're John. Hey, be humble and realize I'm a sinner. I am weak. I'm pathetic. I don't care what that preacher says if he's going to stab me and tell me something that I don't like to hear. I need it. Yes, yes. If he says I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If he says I need to get right with God, I need to get right with God. If he says I must do this thing even if I don't want to, I must do it. Yes, yes. You need a stab. You might say, I don't like to get stabbed. Then <laughs> let me tell you something. You'll never live in life. It's impossible to go through life the next, 80, uh, the next 60 years of your life, it's impossible to go that way without a single rebuke to you. Impossible. But hey, we're in a liberal culture. We're so used to tolerating each other and not rebuke the person and say, you're wrong, but rather say, oh, it's different. It's unique. And maybe God could use it. And we, that's why we have different colors of the rainbow. No, you're wrong. And you need to receive that. That's a culture shock in this day and age, but we need to hear it. You're wrong. You need to get right with God. No, who do you think you are? I'm a minister, Paul. I went with you. I'm John Mark. I preached with you. And that's right. You're just a John. You're not a Paul. Swallow your pride and say, I need that. Thank you. Thank you for stabbing me. I need help. You want help? Yeah, you'll need that. You can't go in an operation table when you're sick and dying without a ah, and they cut you up so that they can heal. Also, here's another thing. You notice another thing about John the Baptist after verse 23? And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. Notice that John was satisfied with that answer. The messengers were satisfied with that answer alone, and they took it to John. John never sent his messengers again. John said, that's good enough for me. Thank you. I'm happy with it. I will apply it in my life. He didn't hear the answer from Jesus and then got the stab and said, thank you, and then went to another person and said, I need help, and... What the, you know what, what the problem is? He wasn't satisfied with the previous answer then. Right. You know what people like to do when they dump burdens? Tell as many people, as many friends or loved ones or pastors that they want. How about that? You know why? They're not satisfied. They weren't pleased with the stab that they got that they needed to apply. Right. Yeah. But they're helping you, but you're rejecting it. You're rejecting every help God gives to you and say, no, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. I need, why can't I find something that would help me out there? Why? Because you're doing that all the time. You're rejecting every help that God has given to you in your life. No better help than God. And if your help has run out, there's a problem with you, not God. You know what that was right now? Ah, that's what it was. Do you apply the counsel or do you disregard the counsel? 
My fifth point is the subject of parting. The subject of parting. Now, uh, look at Acts 13, 13. As I mentioned to you before, the Holy Spirit never mentioned John's reason for parting. You notice that? Acts 13, 13. John was angry at Paul because he was too mean and departed from them. No, it just said John departed from them. Simple. Simple. God just kept it that way. Now, this is even more interesting. Go to Acts 15. The Holy Spirit would not tell you John's problem. If there's something anybody would want to know is, what was John's problem? Look at Acts 15. The Holy Spirit won't give it to you. Weird. I don't know why. Okay, so let's look at this. Acts 15, 37. John Mark was brought up again, okay? And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. All right. And the contention was so sharp between them that they, that they departed asunder one from the other. Now notice right here, the Holy Spirit won't tell you what John Mark's issue is, even in this passage. Even more enlightening is Paul and Barnabas fought with each other, right? Now when you fight, and with Paul and Barnabas, if this fight made them split ministries, when they were buddy buddies and got stoned to death together and all that, whipped, beaten for Christ together, that must be some big fight. When you have a big fight, you don't finish it 30 seconds. You don't finish it five minutes. You go hours. Hours long. A lot is stated. A lot of specifics given. Paul said, I don't like John Mark because this, this, this. Barnabas said, well, John Mark is this, this, this. And all those specifics are given and the Holy Spirit said, no, I'm not going to write that. You know why? God respects the anonymity of the burden. Okay. And he does want to keep it silent even after you confess it. That's good. I'm afraid to confess and because it's so private to me. God understands. Don't you think he understands? Okay. He understands. He'll respect the anonymity, the privacy of it, and he would want to do what he can to keep it silent. This is not a church gossip room, which is unfortunate nowadays. And if you're gossiping about some brother and sister in Christ, sh shut your mouth, keep it to yourself. Because you don't want them talking trash in your problems either. The job of the church is to bear one another's burden, not gossip about each other's burdens. And the thing is, is that we respect the anonymity, the privacy of it, keep it that way. So why are you afraid to confess it if God's intention is not to publicize it to the whole world? But I'll tell you what, it will be publicized to the whole world if it's left unresolved and at the judgment seat of Christ, okay. it'll be shown. Yeah. But if it's covered underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Because you resolved it, you got some things right with the Lord, it's respected. All right, sixth point, the starting place, the starting place. Look at Acts 15 and 39 again, Acts 15, 39. Notice the Bible says, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Mark, notice, he didn't go with the Apostle Paul uh, where the Apostle Paul was going from place to place to place. This is Paul, man. He was planting churches left and right and God was using him, soul winning here, growing spiritually over there, accomplishing this feat. John Mark didn't say, okay, I'm ready to get back in the game. All right, Paul, let's go. Yeah, soul win that place and spiritually grow right there. I'm going to accomplish those same feats with you. No, the Holy Spirit never led John Mark there. The Holy Spirit said, you're going back to the place where it all started. Wow. 
where you weren't doing okay. We're going back to the island of Cyprus. Isn't that what it said at verse 39? That's where John Mark wasn't doing okay. John Mark wasn't ready for Rome. He wasn't ready for uh, the other places that got called. Philippi, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Corinth. God said, no, you're not ready for that. We're going back. We're going back. But Paul's way ahead and I got to catch up, God. And God's like, hey, Come on. you're not going to jump 90 miles again, buddy. Yes, yes. From those steps to Paphos and say, I got to catch up with Paul. I got to catch up with Paul. You need to go back step by step. You need to retrace the step. Those issues you left unresolved and say, okay, stop right here. God, I gotta go to the next place. Paul is planting 10, uh, already 100 churches. I didn't plant one yet. And God's like, no, stay right there. Yes. That's the step you left unresolved. Yes. Yes. Now let's you and I talk about it. That's good. Let's get some things right with God over here. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit doing that with John Mark? And God said, remember, that was the issue you overlooked. We're going step by step right there. Salamis to... Pathos. Ready? One step. Two step. Yeah, you were doing okay there. Oh, right here. Step number five. What was that issue? God, I'm doing okay. And God's like, no, stop, stop. You're, slow down. Yes. Right here. What was your issue? You weren't there. You weren't there for the ministers. You fell behind here. You didn't took us seriously. Your problem is laziness. Oh, I didn't see it that way, God. And God's like, yeah, now it's time to look at it. You're lazy. You're lazy. Now you need to wake up earlier. You need to help them out faithfully. You can't skip some services here. Get this resolved. <sighs> yes, Father. And okay. Maybe God, when he's dealing with those issues with Mark, I could imagine... Maybe as every step Mark took, God had to teach him his issue. Right here, you need to stop dumping burdens on people. You need to be strong and depend on me. Fix that issue. Or maybe the Lord said, you know, you got to be humble and say, I need help. You got to realize you're not the great preacher. Or maybe God had to teach him. I don't, every step there's always, I know this with God. Every step you take, there's a whole bunch of issues you yes, got. Yes. <clears throat> and he's showing you one at a time. You can't dump a burden here. You got to ask for help here. Over here, you didn't take the rebuke well, did you? Uh, oh, God, that person don't understand. And he thinks he's so spiritual, knows everything. Uh, ah, ah. We're not taking that next step to Paphos. Until you get this resolved. You're going to take rebuke, huh? Yes, sir. Why? Because I'm older. Because I know more Bible than the person. Because I've been in the ministry for many years. Yeah, that's your issue. Fix it. Yeah. Then you're used to taking the stabs. And then God's like, okay, good. Keep walking. Keep going. And then God shows him another issue. Maybe another issue John Mark had was, remember, okay, you asked for advice, you were humble, but you didn't apply it, did you? Oh God, I heard and I said thank you and their advice was good. Did you really apply it? You forgot what they told you, didn't you? You didn't take it seriously, did you? Why? Well, because I was busy and because I had this and that. And God's like, uh, 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 remember those other steps that I talked to you about, about your busyness, about your other excuses? I thought we got those resolved. I guess those issues weren't really fixed, huh? Yes, Lord. All right, fix those. Now can you follow the advice or you still got excuses? I'll follow the advice. I'll t apply it seriously this time, God. And God's like, good, let's do it. God, I heard that Paul's in prison in Rome now. 
Oh, I got to catch up. And I heard he's going to Jerusalem. God, I got to catch up. God, he, Paul's on his fourth missionary journey. I'm still stuck in this stinking island. And God's like, that's right. You and me, buddy. Get those steps right with God first. That's good. That's good. Tom, I was like, oh, yes, sir. And he gets it right with God. I heard Paul's dying, God. I got to catch up. God's like, ah, uh, go back 90 miles. Got that fixed? Yes, Lord. Go to Paul. That's good. Last epistle. Last writing before he died. Second Timothy. Paul said, take Mark. He's profitable to the ministry. You think you're really okay, aren't you? You need to go back. You need to go back to the island of Cyprus. You need to retrace your steps and see which issues are still lingering you left unresolved. Maybe you need to stop dumping burdens and be strong in the Lord, depend on Him. Maybe you need to humble yourself and ask for advice, even if you think you're doing okay. Maybe you need to take in the rebuke and not be afraid. Maybe you need to seriously apply the advice this time, not just be happy and say thank you and make, it, make the advice make you feel good. This preaching is not to make you feel good and you say, that's a good job, pastor, thank you. It's to be applied. Maybe you can take your first steps on this altar. Every head bow and every eye shut.